Surprise! Welcome back, my loyal subjects, to the epilogue of Zero Time Dilemma. I was informed... Well, I went to the, uh... I went to the... GameFAQs board, and apparently... There are... Text... There are text epilogues... Fast forward, final decision, or uh, actually, we go into the menu. No, not save. We're gonna go to file? Okay, yes, so here it is. The text epilogues for all the characters. Um, wow, that's a lot of stuff. Have I always had these? Decision game rules. I've never looked at this. Hmm. Six X passes. Okay. Latin phrase three, incinerator, gap level, crash keys. All this stuff. Or maybe I did. Two to the power of a hundred. I don't know. I don't remember what that uh really meant. Multiverse in the single path one. Protagonist P travels down a road until you, the player, choose the left path, and P ends up abducted by terrorists and holed up in an underground cell forever. You try a second time by selecting the right path. You avoid the terrorists, but P is hit by a truck and permanently handicapped. Getting annoyed, you sigh and go back and choose the last route straight down the middle. P comes across a man attacking a girl from an affluent family and fights him off. The girl and P fall in love, get married, and live happily uh, together happily. By this point, the game is mostly over. It is it is this ending that is considered the best end. But is it really? What do they mean? P. Taking the multiverse theory into consideration, the P who chose the left path, LP, must think, why am I not the P who chose the center path and instead stuck in this cell? But if there's only one world, then LP's history disappears once P chooses the center path. Some of you may be thinking, then why isn't it just a straight road? But it's not that simple. What about what happens with the P who picked the right path? He gets into an accident, but after extensive rehab, wins a gold medal at the Paralympics. Uh, he marries a beautiful wife, has several children, and by the time he's old, there are many grandchildren too. So consider again, if the world is one single path, what about RP's life? Where did his glory go? What about his happiness with his family? If the only one who remains is CP with his rich wife, a rich wife, is that a true happy end? Oh. They say all of that to say what? The murder 17 years ago. Where the air ducts go? Oh, active time. Um... So it's C, it goes CQD, and it's broken up into 90 minute chunks. What the heck? Where the air ducts go? Wards CQ and D being in the same space means the air ducts in the prep room and lounge don't lead to other wards. Inside is simply a small space for Gab where he often rests on a rug. Oh, so that explains why what? So Gap doesn't actually go to different wards. He's just going in there and coming out at random intervals. And the way the game is set up, it makes it seem like he's traveling from one place to another. I didn't even think about that. The murder 17 years ago. 17 years ago, why did she switch to... Wait, was she... A... No one knows why she avoided the snail. Was she afraid of them or felt a sense of danger from it? Whatever the case may be, the snail caused her to switch to the left path. As a result, she was killed by a girl. Ooh. The suspect who was taken into custody, a Japanese man, was not the culprit. He was falsely convicted and executed, and his wife committed suicide in her grief. The two left young children behind, who are Akane and uh, Aoi. The convicted man called a taxi before his arrest, but the taxi ended up picking up another fare instead, a brilliant surgeon. However, the car became involved in an accident, killing the surgeon as well as the young boy who was waiting for an operation by the surgeon. If that snail hadn't been on the right path 17 years ago, what would have happened? Life is simply unfair, don't you think? Mm. 
post-apocalypse. This must be fate. Fate. Diana smiles weakly from the bed at Sigma's question. Don't you remember? You told me that yourself. Me? I never said that. If it really was me, then... Yes, the Sigma who was 67 inside. Diana shifts her frail hand closer to Sigma and he gently grasps it between his own. The Sigma before her is not the one who was trapped in the shelter. It's the same body but a different consciousness. On April 13th, 2029, Sigma was at the headquarters of Crash Keys, his eye and his arms replaced with robotic ones. There, the young Sigma returns to his body from 45 years, uh, years in the future and begins to carry out Akane's instructions. How many years has it been since you came here, Diana? A little over three, I think. I followed you here in May 2029. A violent coughing fit takes over after she speaks. Sigma helps her sit up and softly pats her back until it subsides. Why didn't the medical pod work? I told you, it's fate. Diana's skin is deathly pale, but her eyes still shine with life, just like a child's. That must be... what? I've always dreamt of coming here. Did you know that Diana is the name of the goddess of the moon? I've wanted to do this ever since I was little, so I'm perfectly fine with dying here. They're already on the moon? What are you saying? I've been able to spend the last three years living with you, Sigma. I have treasured every moment. Sigma lowers his head, his expression pained. Please don't make that face. You don't need to be sad. In the year 2074, you will shift back to Christmas 2028, and the next day... Old me will head to the decom facility in the Nevada desert and meet you. Diana nods. Sigma closes his eyes and shakes his head. That's not it. I mean, I'm in love with the you. His declaration stops as Diana's lips close over his in a kiss and the rest of his words are lost. After a moment, Diana murmurs, it must be a wonderful future. The future where we found each other in 2028. Sigma holds on to her tightly aching heartfelt sobs echo within a cold silent world so that's that's their really really bad ending then so they young sigma and young diana only got to spend three years with each other before she died i thought diana died of radical six though i guess not a robot's name the robot with a round helmet on his head is named sean he has never been called anything other than that by those in the underground shelter. Right! You'd have to go back and replay it to realize that BS. The other Phi. <sighs> Baby Phi was indeed transported from 1904 to 2008, but a Phi also remained in 1904. That's right! I didn't even think about that. Whatever happened to that Phi... Rumor is she became a brilliant scientist and worked at a research facility in the U.S. well into her hundreds. The facility was researching the transporter, and that's where Phi, the Phi from 1904 is sent. Was Phi sent to herself in the future? No, because it would have been a different reality, right? Man, I don't know. Post-payoff Carlos 1. The day is bright and clear. A girl in, white dress, a girl in a white dress strolls along the beach the wind tossing her long blonde hair playfully. Up until a half a year ago, she had been confined to a bed. Carlos's eyes still tear up every time he sees her smile. Come on, Carlos, you don't always have to help me. That's the point of my rehab. Oh, you're right. Sorry, Maria. Carlos brushes her hair out of her face. It's definitely not the summer sun that's making him act out of sorts. It's the fact that his sister is here standing before him. Maria grins up at him. What would Akane and Junpei say if they saw you being all fussy like this? It's fine. They understand how important you are to me. Both you and Junpei put your lives on the line. That was a different history. But going through that means we know how to treat reverie syndrome. I can't believe we have the ability to jump through space-time. I'm just glad you're here. Uh, you're able to control it now. It's all because Carlos met Akane and Junpei that Maria was able to recover. He wishes he could show them just how well she's doing. Is there a reason he can't? You're thinking about them right now, aren't you, Carlos? What makes you say that? Because you're smiling? Carlos closes his eyes as his unconscious smile turns fond. They're just about your age. It kind of feels like I gained a brother and another sister. You are going to their wedding, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. 
and you're coming with me. But there is something Carlos needs to do first, back when the three of them parted ways. I'll be waiting to hear word from you when you locate that terrorist. Carlos held his right hand out toward Akane and Junpei, and the other two grabbed onto it with their own. There was no way of knowing if Delta was telling the truth, but if he was, one fanatic would kill off all of humanity. Akane and Junpei vowed to find this person, and Carlos offered to help. He can still feel the strong bond between the three of them, their hands clasped together tightly. I suppose I'd better get used to talking more before the wedding, huh? Holding her hair out of her face, Maria reaches out to her brother, who takes her hand in his, and they continue walking toward uh, down the beach. The same blue sky above them stretches over friends Carlos knows he can rely on. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Akane and Junpei are getting married? Which, like, directly contradicts something that Uchikoshi said after VLR, or 999, where Akane and Junpei never met up again and had a bad end. But I guess v the VLR timeline is one where all the bad crap happens, so who cares about them, I guess. Post payoff Akane and Junpei 1. Junpei sits upon a white sofa somewhere within the secret location of Crash Keys, twiddling a pen and sighing. Hmm. What else should I say? Lying on the table in front of him is a half-written letter. Suddenly, Akane pops up behind him. What are you doing, Junpei? She playfully teases. Ugh! <laughs> Junpei dives for the letter, but she snatches it from his fingers and begins reading. Let's see... Carlos, without you, Akane and I would have never gotten together. Thank you. Is this an invitation to the wedding? No, it's most definitely not! He makes a grab for the paper, but Akane quickly moves it out of his reach. It's just a progress report, Junpei mutters. Okay, yeah, I mentioned the wedding, but the date hasn't been set yet. I made a promise to you and your brother. We wouldn't get married until we've dealt with the fanatic. Akane's face flushes bright red. She hastily hides her face behind the letter and goes back to reading. I'd like nothing more than to get the approval and blessing of our old friends and those of you we met six months ago. Eyes wide, Akane glances up at Junpei. He avoids her gaze, awkwardly scratching the back of his head. Junpei? I still can't get over how Junpei doesn't look like how he was in 999. He was... He looks so much older and deader inside. You know, there's a history where I keep searching for you, even after I'm old and craggly. It still exists out there somewhere. And when I think of that... A sharp pain jolts through Junpei's face. Akane is pinching his cheek. Ow, that hurts! What are you doing? To prove to you that this isn't a dream, Akane giggles. You still can't believe we're together like this? Junpei shakes his head. You've changed a lot, Junpei. A half a year ago, you were never this honest. It's like... How do I want to describe it? <laughs> like a dream? Huh? Junpei leans in and quickly pinches Akane. Oh, now you've done it! She darts forward and goes after Junpei with both hands, getting in a pinch wherever she can, and Junpei does the same. Once they start laughing, it's very hard to stop, and they keep going until they're out of breath. I guess... This is all thanks to Carlos, too. That's why I'm writing that thank you letter. On Akane's left hand, a ring glitters on her ring finger. Aw. Okay. Now, Sean, Eric, and Mira... I kind of want Eric, I mean, Eric to adopt Sean and Mira to go to jail for the rest of her life. Hey, Mira, how are you feeling? Are you lonely? <sighs> Come on, Eric, you visited last week. Eric smiles wryly and reaches out to Mira with his left hand. Mira does the same and their hands with matching silver rings align on, uh, on either side of the plexiglass window. I brought a new guest to see you today. Eric shifts to the side and a head pops into view. You're... Hi, Amira. Long time no see. It's Sean, right? Yeah, I'm happy you remembered. Behind Mira, the sun is shining through an iron-barred window, lighting up the visitor room. It's been a long time, Sean. It's good to see you. The smile that appears on her face is real. Mira no longer needs to plaster on a fake one. When I heard you turned yourself in, I was really surprised? Is Mira in jail? Eric was the one who convinced me. He said I should pay for my sins so we could be together. Mira's killed people, though. 
There's no way she wouldn't. I guess it kind of depends on the state she's in. But if she turned her in, she should be getting the death penalty, right? So that's why you got married in jail. Eric ducks his head shyly. Are you sure you're okay with this? Mira asks. He looks at her in confusion. Okay, first of all, Mira is a psychopath and a sociopath. So she doesn't understand human emotions. And didn't they... Like, that's something... Did they say something like that? But that's something that you're born with, aren't you? She can't just have a real smile all of a sudden. Don't you regret marrying me? I Oh, don't you regret marrying me? I did carve your heart out in another history. Isn't that what you said, Sean? Yeah, you did. And Mira killed... Mira killed... Actually, I'm still not 100% on whether Mira killed Junpei. But Mira killed... Diana, Phi, uh, or D she killed Diana, Sigma, and uh, Akane, uh, Sean, and Eric in different histories. She literally killed over half of the people who were in there in different histories, which means she was willing to do it when it started, and she just gets off scot-free? That's dumb. Eric looks Mira straight in the eye. I've already told you this a bunch of times. I forgive you, no matter what happens. Besides, you haven't killed me in this history yet, right? Yet, Mira's list tw lips twist wryly. Right? They got out, they lived happily together for a long while, and then she killed him. But the Heart Rippers killed people already. So many. Sean, stop it. Eric turns angrily on Sean and Mira's face falls into a frown, but Sean continues speaking. You turned yourself in, Mira, but that doesn't mean you've paid for all the crimes you did. I doubt the family and friends that were left behind will forgive you even if you were put on death row. There's no way you can clear your sins here. Mira grits her teeth. But there is a way to clear them. Well, not what you've already done, technically. You'll have to pay for those your whole life. That will never change. But maybe you can in another universe. No, I don't think so. I'm fairly certain she can't. That, that ship has sailed. Suddenly, Sean's fist crashes through the plexiglass window. What? Ah! Mira jumps backward while Eric is frozen in shock? What are you? Eric can't even finish speaking before Sean moves. Jumping through the broken window, he kicks the outside wall of the visitor room causing it to crumble and reveal a giant hole. An alarm immediately starts blaring and police officers rush into the room, but Sean darts forward and takes them all down in a blink of an eye. He holds a hand out to Mira. Let's go! Go where? I know where the transporter is being stored. You're saying we should go change history? Eric finally stutters. Sean nods. To stop young Mira from committing murder, Mira, I'm pretty sure that's the only way you can clear your sins. Mira stares out through the hole in the wall at the horizon extending beyond. No! I mean, I guess... That's still... They can use the... First of all, how does Sean know where the transporter is being stored? Second of all, I guess... I guess if there's a history out there... Where there's a Mira... There's a history, if if they go and create a history where there's a Mira who never commits that first murder, then she would technically be sinless, but she would still be the same person in the end. Like, she would still be the same person willing to do, well, I guess they do. They're talking about the them, like, the them who are just a few, like, the, the ones who won the coin toss and the people who lost the coin toss being completely different people. So I guess a young mirror who never commits murder by their logic would be a vastly different person from the from the heart ripper mirror who Eric married. I'm not okay with that. I'm okay with Eric and and Sean being together as a family unit. But Mira getting a happy ending? Like, this Mira will never... And I'm glad Sean tells her that. He's like, you're never going to be sinless. But we can create a history out there where you are sinless. And you can live as you please. Oh my gosh. What matters is that there's enough of a sequel hook for there to be a fourth game. It would have to be... They'd have to create something better than the decision game. Because ultimately, the decision game wasn't as... 
wasn't as high energy. It was high energy, but it wasn't as engaging of a concept as the a as the Ambidex edition of the nonary game or the plain old nonary game. Um, man, this is already longer than the actual finale was. Uh, and this is gonna be the last man. This is gonna be the last solo zero time dilemma episode I ever do. So, uh, I guess to end it off, I'm glad they made the game. I don't want anyone walking away from this. I don't want any of you guys walking away from this thinking that I wasn't ecstatic when Zero Time Dilemma was created. So, uh, despite all of its faults, I'm glad we got to meet Sean and Eric and Mira. I hate Delta with a passion. I think that was the dumbest thing ever. Uh, and there's still a lot of places that this story could go. But as a grand finale to Zero Escape series, there's another history out there where it's way worse. So... Bye for now, guys.